Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the uh, Doubletree Hotel and the 16th Annual Kern County Economic Summit. My name is Jeff Lamucci. It's my honor and privilege to serve as your Master of Ceremonies this morning. I'd like to thank Richard Chapman and everyone at the uh, Kern Economic Development Corporation for the opportunity to be here. This really is one of the highlights of my year, and I hope it is for you as well. Before we begin today's program, I'd like you to please stand and join me as we individually and collectively reaffirm our allegiance to the United States of America by saluting the flag that represents our great country. Salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. We appreciate your uh, getting up early this morning and being with us. Uh, I trust you'll find it was worth the effort, as I'm confident the important information shared by this morning's speakers and panelists will be relevant, useful, and thought-provoking. As we get underway, I want to take an opportunity to thank the people who made today's event possible. The Kern County Economic Summit is an event co-hosted by the Kern Economic Development Corporation, California State University Bakersfield, and the Greater Bakersfield Chamber of Commerce. It's through the strength of their partnership and commitment to the community that the Kern County Economic Summit has grown to be known as the premier economic event in the Central Valley, and that's certainly evidenced by your attendance here today. We want to thank our many sponsors, including our platinum sponsor, Dignity Health, and our 11 gold sponsors, Pacific Gas and Electric Company, the County of Kern, Chevron, Valley Republic Bank, San Joaquin Community Hospital and Kaiser Permanente, TBC Media, Bright House Networks Business Solutions, Bakersfield Association of Realtors, Tahone Ranch, State Farm, and Wells Fargo. Page two of your program contains a complete listing of sponsors, and let me just say, if you're not there, you could be and should be, and I'm sure one of our committee members would be glad to to help you out in case you're interested in sponsorship. But for those of you who are on that list this year, we want to say thank you. This event would not be possible without your support. So would you all join me in thanking our wonderful list of sponsors. Whether this is your 16th uh, visit to the Kern Economic Summit or your first, we're pleased to present you this morning with a day filled with outstanding speakers, noted economists and business leaders who will provide you with valuable information concerning national and regional economic issues. And they will share how all of this influences the growth and future of Kern County. Today is a forum designed to explore ways we can sustain and advance economic prosperity in our growing region. Before I give our podium to our platinum sponsor, I'd like to call your attention to two things. First of all, if you would silence your cell phones and other electronic devices, we certainly do appreciate that. And we thank you for being uh, considerate of others today. The second bit of housekeeping is regarding the insert you'll find at your setting underneath your program. It's the speaker evaluation form. We ask you to complete it because it's really important for our gathering, uh, our organizing committee to gather information and we honestly look at the evaluations. We use your feedback to plan the next year's event. So you can leave it at your place setting when you leave today or drop it off at the registration desk lo located outside the ballroom. So we appreciate your taking the time to do that. I'd like you to uh, Help me welcome to the podium Mr. Walter Ray, Vice President of Business Development for Dignity Health Mercy Hospitals. This is the fourth year Dignity Health has taken part as our platinum level sponsor, and we're grateful for their continued support. So please welcome Mr. Walter Ray. Good morning, everybody. Uh, well, to start off, uh, I am not one of those great economic speakers that we were just talking about earlier, so you'll have to suffer through me for a moment. Uh, and before you ask yourself, um, I do moisturize, so I look a lot younger than I really am. <laughs> so thank you for bearing with me. Uh, my name is Walter Ray. I am the Vice President of Business Development uh, for Mercy Hospitals, uh, part of Dignity Health. 
And we are proud to once again be the support the Kern County Economic Summit and the efforts of this amazing staff in helping businesses in our county reach their full potential. The challenge in healthcare, because that's what I'm gonna speak about, because I'm in healthcare, but the challenge in healthcare is balance as we move for towards, especially this uncertain time in the 2016 presidential elections and what the outcome or future will hold. Here in Kern County, though, we are poised to meet the growing challenges of managing chronic health problems such as diabetes and heart disease, where we live with some of the highest numbers in the state of California. It's always fun to be at the top of a, a list, and that's us. Um, as the, the largest hospital system on the West Coast, we know that with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, the government is favoring larger health care systems which is the reason why you're seeing so many changes in the hospital landscape, as well as the healthcare landscape. Many standalone hospitals and small systems are finding it difficult to survive and are now looking to join larger healthcare systems. Dignity Health Corporation, which is based in San Francisco, is committed to the success of Bakersfield. They're quite fond of Bakersfield in the Central Valley. In just the past two years, we've expanded our footprint in this community, aligning with local healthcare businesses, including uh, our recent partnership with the Grossman Burn Center, the Comprehensive Blood and Cancer Center, the Millennium Surgery Center, US Health Works, and Gem Care and Managed Care Systems. Uh, Dignity Health has also endorsed our plan to better serve the healthcare needs of the residents of Kern County. Uh, we continue to move forward on our construction of the new 120 bed tower at Mercy Southwest Hospital. That's a personal project of mine and very exciting as we move forward, so thank you for that. This tower and the related overall expansion to Southwest will enhance our tertiary services there, uh, bringing an advanced level of technology complete with cardiac and neuro services for our growing neighborhoods in the Southwest and Northwest Bakersfield as well as the outlying communities such as Shafter, Wasco, Taft, Button Willow, and Delano. And for those of you who grew up here in Bakersfield, uh, you probably would never have guessed the west side growth as, as large as it is. Growing up on the east side, we never thought we would go that far out west, but that's where, that's where I live now. So uh, this is more than just an announcement of a new construction project. This is an investment in economic growth in Kern County with the expansion of services and jobs and the advancements of our longstanding commitment that started over 100 years ago with our Sisters of Mercy that traveled up here to Bakersfield and has continued with Memorial Hospital and throughout the years. But it's a, a longstanding commitment to serve the residents of Bakersfield and, and of Kern County and to ensure that, that there's a quality state of health care uh, with state-of-the-art care and services available to everyone here. The goal for all the hospital systems here in Bakersfield is try and keep us here. As much as we enjoy visiting Los Angeles, we would much rather receive our health care here and we're, we're getting very close to being able to keep you here for everything. So that's, that's the goal that we all share and we hope that you share that with us as well. I'd like to thank you all for being here today and hope you'll join us in continuing your support at the dedicated work of the Current Economic Corporation, their Development Corporation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Walter, very much. We appreciate your comments, and thank you once again for your sponsorship. I'd like to welcome Richard, Chap welcome Richard Chapman. He's the president and CEO of Current Economic Development Corporation. When I saw Richard this morning, I walked up to him and went, And he said, do you have laryngitis? I said, I can't tell you. Anyway, the, the look on his face was priceless. <laughs> but uh, I'd like to welcome Richard to the podium to introduce our first guest speaker. And Richard, thank you for all you do uh, to help put this uh, day on today. It's a great, great opportunity. And I, I, again, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jeff, and um, I appreciate my limited time up here, I hope, and I'm sure you will as well today. And uh, I, I would be remiss uh, on behalf of myself and our organization if, if I didn't ex express 
our immense gratitude and appreciation for Ray DeZember. Uh, Ray was one of our co-founders. Thank you. Thank you. Ray was one of our EDC's uh, co-founders back in 1988. And I, I had the, had the uh, privilege of knowing him uh, for my short time here, nine years. And you know his optimism, humility, and vision for the community, I, I believe were unparalleled. And um, definitely an icon and, and um, definitely committed to moving forward uh, and incorporating his vision. And it, it is a really a, you know, testament to his um, guidance that uh, you know, Kern County uh, has, has succeeded uh, and will succeed in the future. And it definitely inspires, uh, should inspire us all. Uh, if you look at just another, uh, you have a lot of handouts and bags, but uh, happy to announce that our uh, market overview uh, investor directory the monochromatic uh, version is uh, on your table. So that was a um, great labor of love for our organization. I, I, kudos to Fiona Lytle, who's no longer at our organization with Air Energy. Thank you for being the architect, and thanks for our team uh, working uh, to create such a, I think, a masterpiece. And we'll be hard pressed, but I, I'm confident next year we'll uh, be as um, impressive as this uh, edition. This will be online, kdc.com. So we have the hard copy and you know, let us know if you need also the PDF or what ISSU, I'm not sure all those iterations. The millennials get it, so um, I, um, hopefully uh, you will appreciate that. And again, Kern County and all its glory, all its potential comes out in this document. Now I'm going to introduce, I know he's probably wondering when I'm going to mention his name, but uh, Dr. Thornburg is going to be coming up to the stage shortly. Uh, we had the privilege of having dinner with him last night. Uh, he was more informally dressed, but that's a long story last night. Some of you will get that. Um, and uh, you know, his resume is very impressive. I will not read it all. He'll probably tell you about all his accomplishments. Um, but his, his, his understanding of our economy moving forward, and I think it's appropriate. Uh, uh, he is the founder of Beacon Economics, but also uh, serves a director of Center for Forecasting at Riverside, UC Riverside. We'll, you'll be hearing later uh, from Emilio uh, Ramirez about the Riverside success story. And remember, in the context, we're the number two millennial job center in the country. Riverside's number one. So that's important to understand underlying all the, me all the information today, uh, how well positioned we are for the future. And also according to his resume, he was one of the predictors of the subprime mortgage collapse. I thought that was Christian Bale uh, in the big short. And he, he looks a little taller, so maybe, uh, maybe he had a cameo appearance. We'll let, we'll let him tell you uh, this. Uh, but he was, has a PhD, uh, Chris has a PhD from UCLA, and a BS from State University of New York in Buffalo. So go Bulls. Okay, go Roadrunners, come on. How about the Roadrunners? Come on, see? You, you can tell I like applause, so I put that out there for you. But thank you uh, for your time and commitment uh, to this summit, and hopefully you have a great morning. We'll get you out before lunchtime. Thank you. Dawn's on me. I'm supposed to turn my microphone on here. And let me go ahead and get that done. Testing. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, it is uh, great to be here. Uh, I have uh, been, had the pleasure of being in Kern County plenty of times, uh, but the first time working with Richard and the Kern County EDC, so I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I am kind of, to set things off today, trying to give you some sense of <coughs> what's going on out there in the world. Uh, by the way, I should point out something. Roadrunners, go Roadrunners. Bulls as well. Um, by the way, Buffalo and Bakersfield both had um, the privilege of being in the NCAA tournament this year. And both teams had the privilege of getting wiped out in the first round. That's okay. <laughs> we were there. That's the important thing. So, um, on to more important things. What is going on in the world? Now, if you have not been paying attention, let me kind of go through the litany. 
Uh, market meltdowns, real estate bubbles, collapse of China, oil prices at, I don't know, 14 cents a barrel? Is that how much it goes right now? <laughs> Honey, the kids aren't drinking milk anymore. It's too expensive. Feed them oil. <laughs> um, I can go through everything, turn me turn around. It is uh, nothing but bad news, bad news, bad news. What is going on in the world today? Uh, do, is, is the U.S. Uh, critically in danger of no longer being great? Uh, that's what I'm going to try to give you uh, a little bit of overview today. To start there, I'm going to start with a word. I love words. You know, economists are all about data, but I think words are more important than data because data without words is kind of meaningless, right? Uh, and every time I find a new word, especially one that is as relevant as this word is, I have to communicate that. So the word of the day, the word of this morning is uh, miserableism. Now, miserable, that's a real word. I picked this up, but I love this word. Miserableism is the philosophy of pessimism, or if you will, trying really hard to convince everybody things are really bad when in fact they are not. And boy, are we in a bout of miserableism right now. Now, there's nothing wrong with miserableism. There are people who make a good living with miserableism. Does anybody remember Morrissey? He was a miserableist, right? Huh? And of course, a little more, a little more current, a little more, uh, shall we say, modern generation. Uh, I remember Louis C.K., right? Of course, he's a miserableist. And let's not forget, of course, the stock market's a miserableist. They love miserableism because bad news generates volatility, and volatility generates trades, which generate commissions, which generate profits. And of course, it is 2016, which means, of course, running across our great nation is this group of miserableists all trying to tell us that the only person who has the cure to our ills, of course, is, is them, if they, we put them in the White House. Now, of course, we should point out that the vast majority of these folks have now disappeared, but we are down to a pack of about six miserableists at this particular point in time. <sighs> How true is it? How bad are things? Look, first of all, take a step back. Take a step back. Forget all the noise about recessions and what's going to come next and all these big issues and just look at the underlying facts. Look at what's actually happening out there. This is not bad. Things are fine, folks. Really, honestly, not great, but they're fine. That 2015 was a good year. I know we ended up on a little bit of a soft note, but when you look at 2015 in the whole, it turns out it was one of the better years we've had in quite a while. Labor markets continue to be nice and strong. There's no bubble. There's nothing close to a bubble right now. Housing still in recovery mode. Credit is starting to expand just a little bit, and that's good news for the economy. Commodity prices are down. I realize cheap oil isn't necessarily good for West Kern County, but overall for the U.S. economy, cheap oil is a good thing, not a bad thing. Simple as that. And guess what? California, remember we were written off? The next Greece, the next Detroit failing in a, in a, in a puddle of, of anti-business climate. Well, look, I realize California is a difficult place to work in, but on the other side of it, I also know something that California has been a success story for a long time, and guess right, right now, we are, again, a success story. In fact, right now, California is driving the nation forward. We are one of the strongest components of growth in the U.S. right now. Now, none of this means things are fine. I mean, I, I get it. There's all sorts of issues. We're still growing a little slower than we might want. Uh, state and local budgets are still stressed, too much money going to the wrong things. The global economy is wobbly, particularly China. We're dealing with bad financial regulations, local housing shortages, pensions, entitlements, inequality, political gridlock. I get all that. But here's the key. Here's the key. None of these things can cause a recession. None of these things are going to influence the path of the economy over the next year, the next couple of years. If you want to know what the base forecast is, and, you know, as a forecaster, I'm pretty good at understanding how forecasting works. Here's the reality of the situation. you got two years out of me, okay? Two years. That's what we can really see, two years. And we have two years of growth in front of us, no doubt about it. The chance of a recession in the next two years is functionally zero. Not going to happen. But that doesn't mean the, the business, if you will, of business is done, and quite the opposite. We need to focus our attention on these midterm challenges. And that's what bothers me most about all the miserable, miserableism going on in our economy today. We are so busy, wrapped up in the nonsense of what is not or not happening in our economy right now to pay attention to those true midterm challenges. So my goal today, in the context of the 40 minutes I have with you, is to try and give you some sense of, A, why I'm so optimistic about the next couple of years, but then B, 
try to divert your attention a little bit towards the issues that do really challenge us, things we should
Xer. And if I sound a little bitter, bitter about millennials, it's because as an Xer, by, gen, by definition, I'm bitter about everything. <laughs> but, but who wouldn't be? Who wouldn't be? We are, we are caught between the boomers and the millennials, which are two groups of the most spoiled people on the planet, as far as I can tell, <laughs> leaving us poor Xers in the middle having to pick up the mess. But anyway, Xers, go. Raise your hand if you're an Xer. Power, power, sisters and brothers. We will, we will persevere. Anyway, look, the biggest change in the population base today is, is not the, is the 16, 24-year-olds grew 4% over the last 10 years. 25 to 54 didn't grow at all. That population base fat. The biggest increase is the 55 plus range, it grew 30%. That's all the millennials moving into those later years of the workforce. That's when participation rates naturally fall. Three fourths of this participation rate decline would have occurred even if we had never had a great recession. There's no doubt there are some people on the outside still looking in. But for the most part, the labor markets really have mostly healed at this point in time. And really, this is, again, this is a US economy that's strong, that's doing well. Um, how about consumer credit? That's been expanding very nicely right now, growing about $20 billion per month. Overall, outstanding consumer debt has just gotten above $12 trillion again. One of the big questions is this is good news or bad news. After all, since you did see the big short, you all know that consumer borrowing got, got us into the big problems last time. Well, yes and no. Look, it is true that Americans hold a lot more debt down than they did 15 years ago or 20 years ago. But then again, remember the cost of that debt is much cheaper now because of low interest rates. Indeed, if you look at the financial obligation ratio, the percent of household income used to support current financial obligations, it never really got that high last time. And right now, it's the lowest it's ever been. Never has been debt been less of a burden on American households than right now. The big issue to that last cycle had to do with the quality of debt. Subprime credit card loans, subprime auto loans. Of course, worst of all, the subprime mortgage loans. It was the quality of debt that blew up and created the massive financial chaos in our system, not the quantity of it. And by the way, right now, quality is still too good. The markets are too tight. If you look at, for example, the credit score by origination for mortgage loans right now, the median credit score is above 750. 20 years ago, it was 700. This is a problem. In fact, if I said, what's with consumer debt in our economy today, I would say it's still a problem because there are still a lot of people being locked out of the housing market, which is one of the reasons why the housing market recovery is slow. Now, this, is, of course, is the law of unintended consequences. This all stems from back in the day when Liz Warren got up there. And by the way, people always ask me my politics. I am a radical centrist, OK? That means when any, anybody running for president starts talking, I close my eyes and go, la, 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 I don't want to hear. Because it's a disaster. But again, you know, I, I just love these financial regulations we have, right? Dodd Frank, Dodd Frank. Well, Dodd Frank is based on this idea banks bad, borrowers good. Banks evil, borrowers innocent victims. No, it doesn't work like that. Look, there was a breakdown in credit standards. Everybody on both sides of that transaction was to blame, and we have to prevent that from happening again. Fine, but you don't set up a system that functionally locks these people out of the credit market, which is exactly what Dodd Frank has done. There were a group of Americans got absolutely hammered through this last downturn. They should have had the opportunity to get back in the housing market at this time of historic affordability, and instead they have been locked out. And that is a big problem for our economy. We need to revisit that equation because there are ways of having this conversation that doesn't boil down to bad and good. There's a, there's a much more nuanced central version to that particular conversation. Indeed, if you look across different types of consumer debt, right now every type of consumer debt is seeing lower and lower delinquency rates with one kind, with one exception, student loans. Student loan delinquencies are up. Ah, the student loan crisis. The student loan crisis. You probably heard this on the election trail. The horrible burden, the horrible burden our millennials are carrying today because of the extensive student loan debt that these poor kids are carrying with them. I have never in my life heard such a pile of garbage as a student loan crisis, okay? First of all, right off the bat, who knows this number? What is the average student graduating from college today have in the way of student debt? What's the average student have, anyone? 37, I heard, someone else? 60, I heard, how much? 35, no, you're all wrong. It's $24,000. You might have heard the 35, but here's a little star asterisk after that. They says, the average 35,000 for the students that graduate with debt, because a lot don't. And once you add that into account, it's about $24,000. Folks, that is not a life-altering event. $24,000 of debt is a mid-range Kia, OK? <laughs> Can we be, please 
be <laughs> rational about this conversation. And by the way, take a step back. Where is the largest amount of, where's the biggest problem with delinquencies with student loans? For the student with 150K or the student with 5K? Turns out it's 5K, not 150K. And of course, the person with 150K probably has a medical degree and they're probably starting at 185,000 a year with Kaiser. The person with five was probably some poor person who got suckered into one of these fly-by-night for-profit colleges. That's not a student loan crisis, that's fraud. The debt should be forgiven, the person who made that loan should go to jail, and we should close the school down. But putting that to one side, there is no student loan crisis. Well, is college degree still worth it today? I see that on the internet all the time. Maybe I should stop looking at the internet. This could be part of my problem. <laughs> of course, a college degree is worth it. Look, the net present value of getting a bachelor degree today is $300,000. That's net of taxes paid. That's net of college, college tuition paid. All the above. $300,000. That is still the best investment you will make. And what's most amazing about that number is it's that high despite the terrible educational choices our children are making. <laughs> and that's the big key thing. You know, look, look, back when I went to school all those years ago, to some extent, you get a degree, you'll be fine. Because back then it was still, you know, something new. It was a kind of a thing you held up. Today, everybody goes to college. Not everybody, but a lot of people do. And as a result, that just having a piece of paper is no longer, if you will, the, the ticket to a good... You have to look at a college education like an investment, like any other investment. And unfortunately, we don't have that conversation with our kids. We have some great data now, the American Community Survey. We can actually go through the, the data and figure out what kind of degrees people are getting. And this is degrees people are getting ranked by income. And this is for 21 to 27-year-olds. And it turns out the highest value degrees from a wage perspective for full-time workers is engineering, 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 computer science, engineering, 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 mathematics. You working with me here? In other words, it's all the degrees that don't allow you to necessarily party every single Saturday, Friday, Thursday, Wednesday, and sometimes Tuesday night, OK? Well, that's nice. I, I get that. These are harder degrees. Because they're worth so much, clearly many people are getting these degrees, right? No, not at all. In fact, the number one degree awarded in the U.S. over the last five years is psychology. 300,000 degrees in psychology awarded in the last five years in the U.S., 60,000 per year. Folks, Americans are messed up, but really? 60,000 psychologists per year? I don't think so. This is the conversation, not that there's a student loan crisis, but look, look, I'm not saying don't chase your dreams, but if you want to chase your dreams, may I suggest starting in a community college and then going to a state school. If, on the other hand, you're going to Stanford, you're going to get an engineering degree so you can afford it. That's not a difficult conversation. That's called a rational conversation. That's the kind of conversation we need to have. All right, I'm behind. How about housing? Housing is doing fine. Not great, but fine. Five and a half million sales. Home prices continue to grow at about 5% on a year-on-year -year basis. I uh, look at the big change in growth, mainly the West Coast and the South at this particular point in time. Have homes gone to up too high in terms of prices? Not at all. If you look at housing affordability controlling for 4% mortgage rates, turns out houses, houses are still affordable to a record degree. Yes, affordability has declined, but only from record high levels of affordability. This is a market that still has a lot of legs in front of it. You would look... <sighs> If you look at housing starts, uh, housing starts still weak. We should be running about 1.2 million new single-family housing starts. We're still at 100,000. Again, this goes back to the issues with mortgage origination. The, we, we lock a huge a pop, part of the population. We lock a huge part of the population out of buying a home. It turns out they don't buy homes. We don't build a lot of them. Now things are changing. It's become a little easier to borrow out there, and that will start to help. Our move our economy forward, of course, in the next couple of years. This is a, a positive thing. Yes, it's frustrating the housing market has recovered as much, but because it's been such a slow recovery, think of the legs it's going to have on a tortoise versus here kind of argument. And of course, there's better news. On the left side, th this is one of my favorite graphs out here. On the left hand side is change in households. And this tells such a perfect story for what's been happening in our economy. You can see the huge surge in the middle part of last decade. That's when your 23 year old announced they had just gotten their first subprime loan. And we're buying their first house, and we're going to become the next internet, I'm sorry, next real estate millionaire. Okay? Two years later, when that housing, household formation number collapses, that's when your now 25 year old has moved back into your basement because they got foreclosed on. <laughs> Are you working with me here? Just now, household formations are picking up. People are starting to move out again. 
And as a result of that, more demand for homes, less vacancies. It's going to be a good year for housing. That's important for the U.S. economy. It's going to keep us moving along. How about industrial production? You've probably heard a lot of bad things about manufacturing. Turns out manufacturing's not doing bad. Oh, it hasn't been growing very rapidly, but it is still growing. Manufacturing output is up, not down. I don't care what the ISM index says. That is a survey. It is not an actual number the way the production numbers are. Well, how can that be? How can it be up? Well, you got to remember, there are parts of the industrial production that are doing bad, and there are parts that are doing great. Great is motor vehicles, uh, electric uh, machinery, non-metallic minerals, petroleum refining, furniture. All these are up. What's down is two sectors, mining and non-metallic minerals. That, of course, has to do with the commodity bus going down. In particular, the big crunch has been with mining of new wells. What's going on out there? Why is oil so cheap? Well, look, this is not a demand phenomenon. I can't believe it. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this, this sort of throwaway line in the news. Oil is so cheap because of China. Really? China? First of all, folks, like, like I know China's slow, but they haven't stopped growing. They're still growing. By the way, for anybody who's wondering, in 2015, the Chinese imported 9% more oil than they did in 2014. Cheap oil is not a Chinese phenomenon, period. This is not a demand issue. Oil is cheap, not because of demand. Oil is cheap because of supply. What kind of a supply? American supply. Look, five, six years ago, U.S. production exploded. And we went from a little over 5 million barrels a day to almost 10 million barrels a day. Why? Because of fracking. To put this in context, right now the U.S. is producing more oil than any other country in the world. We're producing 15% more oil annually than Saudi Arabia is. People keep saying, why isn't Saudi Arabia trying to drive prices up? Because they're no longer the swing producer. We are. And by the way, we've had cheap oil for over a year. Why hasn't, why hasn't production fallen? Because they got so far ahead of themselves in terms of fracking that there were over 2,000 drilled wells, drilled unfrack wells, when oil prices started to fall. And every time oil prices go up just a little bit, they uncap a well, crack it, pull the oil out. And this, hasn't, this isn't going to slow down at all. Look, fracking is a brand new technology. We have years and years of supply of oil sitting in the round in shale oil reserves. And we're not the only ones. The Russians have huge oil reserves. Brazil, Argentina, China, everybody has these huge shale oil reserves. This is a brave new world. It's a brave new world. And that means oil is going to be cheap for a while. Now I realize that's tough on Kern County. By the way, you inventing fracking. This is your fault. The Russians and the Saudi Arabians will be following a lawsuit against you any time now. Be prepared. <laughs> but, it, you know, it's a brave new world. Simple as that. And by the way, on net, yes, this is good for the U.S. economy, period. It's good for consumers. It's good for the farmers. It's good for the logistics companies. It's fine. Yes, there should shake out. But it's not going to sink the U.S. economy. Not even close. Look, we've seen this play out before. In the mid-'80s, in the late-'90s, two periods of time, we see big pullbacks in mining in the U.S. economy, and it didn't influence anything. Nothing else happened because it's relatively constrained. And this time, it's even better because right now, while we are getting hit in terms of, uh, in terms of overall decline in mining activity, we're still producing lots, and that's driving other parts of the economy, as the case may be. Indeed, here's some numbers. This is employment indexes for various sorts of parts of the United States. North Dakota's way down. You can see they peaked, and they've come down pretty sharp. I mean, that's that big decline there, it's got to be at least 114 jobs. At least 114 jobs in North Dakota, right? <laughs> but then you go to the next number down. That's Houston, center of, of course, the, the, the shale in, in southeast Texas. And you can see that haven't even stopped growing. I mean, they've slowed down, but they, they haven't shrunk. It's not 1985 where they had one of the worst regional recessions ever. Dallas hasn't slowed at all. People are wondering, will oil sink the U.S. economy? It hasn't even sunk the Dallas economy. So, yes, we're in a transition. There's some companies that are struggling, but for the most part, it's not a big enough challenge to threaten the U.S. recovery, as the case may be. I mean, that part of it's trade. Again, well, the dollar's high, China's not doing too well, that's why U.S. Can't, can't export products. Again, completely not true. The real exports, once you price adjust, real exports have been nice and steady for the last year and a half. They haven't fallen. They haven't been growing, but they haven't fallen. U.S. manufacturers, because of efficiency gains, because of competitiveness, continue to thrive in the global economy despite the fact that the dollar is up 15 percent and the global economy is wobbly. The reason the trade deficit is widening is because of imports. It's because Americans 
have lots of money, and they're spending it, and they're spending it on stuff made in China. That's what's driving the trade numbers. So we're okay, a little bit of a stall, but there's nothing here that worries me. Nothing that's going to slow down our expansion, as the case may be. And what about the bubble? What about the financial bubble? There's no bubble, not even close to a bubble. Yes, I, I know, I, I've heard all the worries about tech and worries about unicorns and worries about the stock market and worries about sub Let's take it, forget it. <coughs> Look, two, two, four reasons why there's no bubble, nothing you have to worry about. Asset prices have gone up a lot, but asset prices have gone up because of low interest rates. Go, go back to your finance class. You know, one thing you remember from finance class, your, your finance professor would say, okay, you have an asset and it gives you $100 every period forever. Interest rate's 5%, what's that asset worth? And you go, oh, I remember this formula. You take your 100, you put it under 0.05, $2,000. Ding, ding, right answer. What if the interest rate falls to 3%? Well, now it's one, one, 100 over 0.03. That means, of course, it goes up to $3,000. Or 3,300, something like that. Anyway, you get the right idea, right? <laughs> That's the key here. We're seeing asset prices go up because we are in a low interest rate regime. Ah, but interest rates are going to go up any day now, right? No. Look, interest rates have been falling for 25 years. They've been falling because inflation has gone away and because we live in a world that is awash with capital. This is a world, back before the Great Recession ever became a thing, Ben Bernanke, when he first got in office as the new head of the Federal Reserve, talked to his first speech was about what he called the global savings glut. The fact that we have far more supply of capital, boomers trying to catch up for retirement, pension funds trying to catch up, China, China whose economy is almost as large as the United States, who has a savings rate two and a half times our savings rate, pouring capital into global markets. Lots of supply, not as much demand, that's a low interest rate regime. That's exactly where we are. So these asset prices make sense in that metric. Now, by the way, there's another reason to, to think about it as well. Here's the key. Every time the stock market goes through one of these conniptures, I want you to remember this. Asset markets don't create recessions. Oh, Wall Street will tell you they do. You hear it all the time. Oh, worry about wealth effects. The financial markets worry about this, worry about that. Your famous old joke, Paul Samus had said this was, the stock market has predicted nine of the last five downturns. Okay? That's because every once in a while, the market periodically freaks out. But unless the real economy is out of whack, unless there's real imbalances, for example, 2006, households weren't saving. 2006, we are building 2 million homes for a nation adding <coughs> 1 million households. All sorts of big problems you could see out there.